Hello there, this is Robin, and I'm your host of the podcast, Creativity, Montessori, and the Meaning of Life. You can find me on Instagram under at Robin underscore Norgren or at UBU for Life. Today I'm going to start with an excerpt from the book Taking Flight by Kelly Ray Roberts. Learning to listen. Sometimes we don't pay attention to what is really calling us because we feel limited or even suffocated by decisions we've already made in our lives. We don't give ourselves permission to change, to evolve, to outgrow past decisions. For me, that meant feeling constrained by my decision to choose social work as my major in college, a very practical route. That one decision seemed to pave the way for a sensible but non-artistic life for years to come, even though the yearnings of a creative life were all around me. In essence, like so many other young women, I felt stuck inside a decision I had made at a very young age, when I wasn't even sure who I was becoming. Has this ever happened to you? Do you feel trapped by a decision you made long ago? Sometimes it's not a past decision that has us feeling stuck, but rather an old role we've historically filled that we can't seem to escape. Perhaps for you, it was being the task-oriented sibling while your brother or sister was the creative one, the productive partner in your marriage, the practical friend and business partner, the good listener. Could it be that your fulfillment of that role has been preventing you from taking on another? In my case, I was feeling surrounded by creative types, decorators, writers, theater majors, filmmakers, painters, and mistakenly thinking there wasn't enough room for another creative soul, that the creative role had already been filled. The good news is that we are so much more than our past decisions and roles. We grow, we change, we evolve. Old decisions and roles may have been very good ones at the time, but we must give ourselves permission to know when it's time to embrace new ones, bit by bit, one step at a time, until we are fully embracing our hearts, whispers, wants, and wishes today. If we don't listen to our hearts' callings, we will continue to allow old decisions and comparisons to lead us down uninspiring and grounded paths where all the while our creative souls want to take flight. Our decisions to embrace our whispers come in all sizes. For some, they're small commitments to finally carve out a few hours of every weekend for creative messes. For others, they may be a renewed resolve to finally sign, finally sign up for that knitting class, or perhaps start applying for creative teaching opportunities. And for some, like me, the decision may not seem to have anything to do with living the creative life at all. Not at first, anyway. As I approached my 30th birthday, my heart became restless with tangled emotions. I felt ordinary, passionless, uncreative. I felt friction in my life as if my heart knew my life was meant for more joy, but my mind told me everything was fine. After all, I had everything I wanted, a loving marriage, a savings account, my health, a supportive collection of friends and family. I had long forgotten about any creative dreams. They had become deeply buried underneath years of following the practical and safe path. Now, vague yearnings began to resurface, but I was having trouble deciphering what they were trying to tell me. Like so many young professionals, I had found myself in a place of creative and spiritual unrest. I had successfully laid the groundwork in my early 20s for a career in marriage. But somewhere along the line, I had lost my personal sense of fun, confidence, and creativity. For years, my husband, who happened to be very good at following his own bliss, would encourage me to do the same. Like me, 
He knew I was missing something huge in my life that would bring meaning and joy. But even though I knew I wanted more creativity in my life, I still didn't understand exactly what my whispers were trying to tell me. I felt a bit paralyzed, not quite sure what to do. And so, like so many people, I did nothing and went along with my life, all the while knowing deep inside that something was missing, feeling like there must be more. Do you also struggle with knowing what to do with your whispers? Perhaps today you are feeling something similar to what I experienced years ago. You listen to your life. You have identified a vague whisper to infuse more creativity into your days. But now you're unsure how and where to begin. Are you doing what I did in questioning your whispers, wondering if there's more to the story? It's an uncomfortable feeling, an instinct that something isn't quite right. But there's an inability to fully describe what it is you may be yearning for. This may mean you're very close, but not quite there. If this is you today, that's okay. You're on the right path to deciphering those yearnings, yearnings. This is where a journal can be very, very helpful. I strongly encourage you to write down your thoughts. If something pops into your consciousness, write it down. If something calls to you, write it down. Even if something just doesn't feel quite right, jot it down. Do the same thing as you go through your daily routine. Identify what is speaking to you. Take photos, take out magazine images, collect quotes and words, compile it all in a journal of whisper evidence, and soon you will notice patterns, gentle nudges, making themselves known. What are they telling you? So um, this ad is sponsored by Anchor. If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. It's free. There's creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. This is an excerpt from a book called Awaken by Phyllis Scherer. Exodus 16.21 They gathered it morning by morning, every man as much as he should eat, but when the sun grew hot, it would melt. There's something about when, what happens once the sun warms up. The heat of the day's trials, the energy-stealing blaze of its pressures and events, Worries can intervene in those afternoon hours when time is racing past so quickly, when we're certain we can't handle them within the amount of daylight that's left to us. Sometimes such stresses can be overwhelming and brazen enough to melt us in our tracks, causing the strength and the resolve of our hearts to weaken and disappear. And while this is reality, this reality is as current and relevant as the day you're living right now, it's also as old as an entire generation of Old Testament Israelites. They emerge from their tents at first light each morning, eager to gather God's gift of manna that he had strewn across the ground overnight. This is a critical part of their day, an appointed activity. For they knew once the sun ascended toward its towering position in the sky, this bread from heaven would melt away. Yes, the collection in their bowl would be more than ample for the day's requirements. They would be able to serve their families and be assured of God's provision based on the abundant measure of what he'd given them. But they would need to wait until next morning before they'd find it again, ready for another day's work. 
Perhaps this ancient illustration depicts for us the reason why our hearts so often stir for a fresh word from God, fresh bread, early in the morning, before the heat of the day has set in. I realize not everyone is a morning person. I realize that, depending on your stage of life and your weekly schedule, your morning may occur at various uncustomary hours of the day. But I'm convinced that morning is a principle, not merely a time of day. It signifies a position of priority, a place of preeminence. Perhaps you tend to devote your first sparks of attention each day to the, to the newscast or your email, to the various trends and updates you've missed while you were sleeping. But those moments are always more valuably invested in waiting before God, feeding on His Word. Listen to what He whispers to your spirit, while your heart is most open and refreshed and able to assimilate truth. So as you move ahead into each devotion of your day, Continue giving him your first waking thought, turned upward like a breakfast bowl, ready to receive the manna he is always so faithful to supply, a fresh word and fresh mercies. Remember the morning principle and prioritize the gathering of manna he offers you. Start each day and each decision with an immediate declaration of complete dependence on him. Because the sun's coming up soon, your manna is on your way. Reading from Steel Like an Artist by Austin Kleong. Garbage in, garbage out. The artist is a collector, not a hoarder, mind you. There's a difference. Hoarders collect indiscriminately. Artists collect selectively. They only collect things that they really love. There's an economic theory out there that if you take the incomes of your five closest friends and average them, the resulting number will be pretty close to your own income. I think the same thing is true of our idea incomes. You're only going to be as good as the stuff you surround yourself with. My mom used to say to me, garbage in, garbage out. It used to drive me nuts. But now I know what she meant. Your job is to collect good ideas. The more good ideas you collect, the more you can choose from to be influenced by. Jim Jarmusch says, Steal from anywhere that resonates with inspiration or fuels your imagination. Devour old films, new films, music, books, paintings, photographs, poems, dreams, random conversations, architecture, bridges, street signs, trees, clouds, bodies of water, light, shadows. Select only those things to steal from that Select only things to steal from that speak directly to your soul. And if you do this, your work and theft will be authentic. Climb your own family tree. Marcel Duchamp said, I don't believe in art. I believe in artists. This is actually a very good method for studying. If you try to devour the history of your discipline all at once, you'll choke. Instead, chew on one thinker writer, artist, activist, role model that you really love. Study everything there is to know about that thinker. Then find three people that thinker loved and find out everything about them. Repeat this as many times as you can. Climb up the tree as far as you can go. And once you build your tree, it's time to start your own branch. Seeing yourself as part of the creative lineage will help you feel less alone as you start building your own stuff. I hang pictures of my favorite artists in my studio. They're like friendly ghosts. I can almost feel them pushing me forward as I'm hunched over my desk. The great thing about dead or remote masters 
is that they can't refuse you as an apprentice. You can all all you can learn whatever you want from them. They left their lesson plans in their work. Thanks so much for stopping by. Please pass along this podcast if you think it'd be something that'd be interesting for someone you know.